And isn't it good that Maggie's never left us? <laughs> I see some unfamiliar faces, so I kind of think I ought to sort of add my particular interest in this psalm. Uh, I probably would have been a zoologist if I hadn't decided to slum it and become a medic instead. Uh, but I did get to spend a decade, well, no, the last decade or so, um, studying creation doctrine and, and, and zoology and, and creation in general with uh, a bunch of scientists online and to write some stuff. So that's, that's kind of my background, but um, we should have a PowerPoint here. There we go. Any fans of Spring Watch here? Yeah. If you watched it or its sister programs, you know, Autumn Watch, uh, Summer Watch, or whichever watches, uh, during the, the last two years to flatten the curve, you'll have noticed how much stress the program placed in those two years on the therapeutic benefits of getting out into nature to deal with some of the real psychological harms that were imposed on us all. And that was very commendable because nature truly is a great healer. And I'm sure many of us have found the countryside or the night sky to be a real source of peace and solace during the hard times. And we are fortunate we have both a countryside and a night sky here. Isn't that great? Chris Pack Packham and co. didn't say a great deal about just why it should be so therapeutic. Um, and a lot of their emphasis was on sort of trendy mindfulness um, and the supposedly proven scientific benefits of substances released by trees, you know, when you walk amongst them and things like that. But to the Christian, whether consciously or unconsciously, our appreciation of nature comes from its taking us closer to God. Uh, as the old hymn says, heaven above is softer blue, earth around is sweeter green. Something lives in every hue that Christless eyes have never seen. And it doesn't mean to say that non-Christians don't appreciate creation but they don't see that their dad made it, you know. Psalm 104 is the great creation psalm. There are some others, but that is, this is the kind of the pinnacle of the psalmists on creation. And in some ways, you know, the explanation that I'm giving should be shorter than the psalm itself because it really explains itself, doesn't it? Um, it's like its own natural history documentary, only Unlike most of the documentaries nowadays, it doesn't go on and on about how creation is going extinct, and it's almost too late for us to save it. And there is a serious theological reason for that, which I will come to. In fact, most of my task this morning is just to point out some of the truths within this psalm, one or two of them which are quite radical and countercultural. You wouldn't have thought nature was countercultural, but it, it can be. Uh, and we may miss it sometimes when we read a psalm like this. We kind of think, like all the Bible, we, we think we know what it says before we start, and so we don't actually sometimes listen to it. So the first heading, with a bit of luck, is that creation points to God. The first thing to notice, I think, in this psalm is that the overall structure of it closely follows the Genesis creation story. So that you could say that Psalm 104 is a kind of commentary, an expansion on Genesis 1. It starts with God in verse 1. It has light and the creation of that in verse 2 and so on. And it ends with God's Sabbath enjoyment of his works in verse 31, just like Genesis does. Now, I needn't labor that parallel because you can check it out later. You can compare and contrast. But I will just point out that whenever the... Old Testament deals with creation. It's not, as you'll hear a lot of people say nowadays, picturing the universe in terms of an outmoded ancient science and cosmology that we can kind of ignore because it's old-fashioned. Instead, what it's doing is describing the world as everyone has always experienced it directly, but interpreted in the light of God as its creator. And as such, the description both in Genesis and this psalm are perfectly compatible with the science of every civilization. And that's a good job, because if it had been only compatible with our science, it would have been irrelevant to most people in the history of the world. But as we see, um, as we will see, 
these words might actually challenge some of the underlying assumptions that people now make when they do science. And that can't be a bad thing. That is to say, this psalm teaches us to see the world as God sees it, rather than as the unbelieving world sees it. And that's the function of the psalm. So let's move on to God's wisdom and power. I like this picture. I would have had this on my book um, on the goodness of creation, but they would have charged me 10,000 quid to use it. <laughs> so just don't tell anyone we projected it here, otherwise you might get a bill. <laughs> Now, I shouldn't have to say much about the first big theme of the psalm, which is how God is the author and maker of everything in nature. He stretches out the heavens in verse 2. He establishes the earth in verse 5. He sets boundaries for the sea and in wisdom makes all the creatures in verse 24 and, and so on. And I think every believer here would say that they know that, don't you? But it wasn't actually always so. It wasn't so obvious at some stage. Uh, the Greek Platonists, who actually influenced some of the stages of early Christianity quite a lot, they thought that God had a whole perfect set of ideas for creation in this kind of perfect realm, but that the actual construction job was bodged by a minor god who goes by the name of a demiurge. It's a semi-worker sort of thing. So that every actual thing we see, according to the Platonists, is, is imperfect. That idea has rubbed off. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Apart from the hands-on descriptions of God as a craftsman throughout, you get that sense, don't you, of him with his, like the other picture, his pair of dividers and his, his workmanlike tools. In verse 31, we read, Let the glory of the Lord endure forever. Let the Lord be glad in his works. There's that kind of pride of workmanship that you get if you do a bit of woodwork or make a new cake recipe or whatever it is, you have done this with your hands and you think, yeah, that's good. And God has that feeling because he's a hands-on God. That ties in, of course, with God looking at his finished creation in Genesis and calling it very good. Do you remember that? God is as pleased with his creation as you would be in a painting that you did or a new recipe that you invented. And in fact, as we saw in Colossians, that passage I read earlier, the New Testament says that God actually created everything through his perfect son, not through an imperfect demiurge. So we should expect to see the perfection of Jesus reflected in creation. We should also expect to see the character of Jesus in his creation. Now, you may think that, that Plato's idea um, of you know, a perfect idea of creation but bodged when it was actually made, you'd think it was dead and gone, wouldn't you? But it's not. A great many people today, and many of them Christians, see Darwinian evolution as a kind of mindless demiurge acting through competitive self-interest to form a natural world that's red in tooth and claw, and not what God would have wanted at all. That idea is kind of around that, that somehow you know, what you see, there's bits of accident in it. But whatever we believe about evolution, whether we think it's tosh or whether we uh, accept it in some form, if we see it as a power in any way independent from the creative will of God, we are contradicting this psalm. And that's the challenge for anyone who's got um, a background in science, is to see how that fits together, how this, these poetic words, these hands-on word, fit with the investigation of nature as we have it. It can be done. <clears throat> but even before evolution came in 150 years ago or so, the idea that the natural world owes more than the de to the devil than to God had somehow developed... Um, Somehow it taught that everything we dislike in nature is a result of the fall, from earthquakes to carnivals. That idea actually was not an early idea. It crept in over somehow, somewhere in the course of history of the church. <clears throat> but both of those things, earthquakes and carnivals, in, are in this very psalm shown to, as evidence of God's glory and wisdom. So verse 32, on earthquakes and volcanoes, he, he looks at the earth and it trembles. 
who touches the mountains and they smoke. Think of that next time you see a news thing about some island erupting over in the Pacific. Verse 20 to 22 on meat eaters. You bring darkness, it becomes night, and all the beasts of the forest prowl. The lions roar for their prey, and they seek their food from God. The sun rises, and they steal away. They return and lie down in their dens. So you see, God himself provides the lions with their food. And that's gazelles and zebras to you, okay? But if you want to know about more about why the natural creation is not corrupted by the fall, then I, I wrote a book about it, and you can get it from all good bookshops. <laughs> oh, I'll lend you a copy for a fee, yeah. Now, this actually, joking aside, is a hugely important point when the human world of sin and deception gets us down, as well it might at the moment, because it enables us to set Springwatch's idea of nature as a healer of mental turmoil on a sound Christian footing. When you look out on the stars on a clear night, as Ray did walking the dog yesterday, or when you look out on the distant hills and the clouds, or on the vast seas when you go down to the Jurassic Coast, or on the, oh, on the dinosaurs when you look at a dinosaur book about the Jurassic Coast, or on the blue tits on your garden feeder, or on the power of the peregrine as it comes and takes out the blue tit on your garden feeder. No, actually, they normally go for wood pigeons. Um, but the power of a peregrine, when you see it, as I did up in, in Dalwood there, uh, just taking out a wood pigeon with one... You can hear it at the bottom of the tree. Whack! And you think, gosh, that's powerful. 200 miles an hour. I mean, that's cool, isn't it? Real spring watch stuff. I could do a Chris Packham and start waxing. <laughs> but anything that's in God's creation, you're seeing God's own handiwork. You're not seeing the accidental outcome of evolution. You might be seeing the, out the outcome of evolution, depending how you understand that. We don't uh, pin you down on that. But uh, we're not seeing an Eden that's been drastically tainted by the slime of the serpent, which was actually a phrase of C.H. Spurgeon, bless him. And when we actually see that this creation that we're living in is actually the one that God designed, that we see in this psalm celebrated as God's work, what that enables us to do is to see that the dreadful human evils around us are actually, in the scheme of things, only a small part of the world, albeit an important one to us as well as to God and indeed to creation. And the worst that times become, and they might get worse before they get better in our current world, the more I think we're going to need to consciously let our eyes pass from the TV screen or whatever it might be, the food bank, to the beautiful world that God has made and lift our hearts to him. Uh, I've been particularly touched when I, when I was writing the book, um, particularly touched by examples of people in the worst human conditions, um, there was a testimony of somebody who was on their way in one of those cattle trucks to one of the Nazi labor camps, Nazi concentration camps. And they stood on some, they stopped, the train stopped and they stood on somebody's shoulders just to look out of the window and saw the world. And it was like heaven. And it's only not like heaven <laughs> because we're so used to it. Um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn told a similar story, you know, in the labor camps, lo going out, logging in 20 degrees below zero or whatever it was with inadequate clothing, inadequate food, people dying, whatever. And this party saw some sort of scene of snow and stopped because of the beauty of it. Because God's world remains beautiful even when our human world is corrupt and damaging. Yes, it's true uh, that he's made it in some ways so powerful that it threatens us. Uh, like those lions which, uh, in verse 23, man only avoids by doing his work in the day and leaving the night shift to the lions. Yeah? 
you don't kind of try and keep on the same ground as lions because they are dangerous. But nevertheless, all of it is the work of God, which is to say the work of our Father. And more than that, it's work which we know he did through the Son who died for us. Creation is our friend because it's from our God, as is very clear from this psalm. See, beauty is so much in the eye of the beholder. There was a time when the conservationists in Yellowstone Park over in America used to shoot all the wolves because they were nasty and cruel and you know, did in the buffalo and other things. And then they discovered that it was actually the wolves that were largely responsible for keeping the whole ecosystem healthy. And as they've, some of you know, as, you've in, as they've introduced wolves again over the last, I think, 40 years, something like that, uh, everything is doing better. Everything. Because God knows how to make a world better than we do, actually. I once saw an interview with a scientist who was studying tapeworms. And uh, the interviewer asked, he said, doesn't it trouble you working with such horrible things? And this scientist, she was visibly shocked. And she said, but they're wonderful creatures. <laughs> and in fact, science shows that they are not only is the biology of tapeworms fascinating, you have to kind of get used to it. You know. I did have a job that dealt with tapeworms once. Before I, in my gap year, rabbits and tapeworms, you want to know about rabbits and tapeworms, I'm your man. But they are as important, apparently, according to science, as to healthy ecosystems as the lions that we admire from a safe distance. They're like top predators. And we don't like them, but God knows how to make things work. So even the, the tapeworms, yeah, have a place in God's creation. So maybe you'll get a book out of the library on tapeworms now. <laughs> but beyond God's wisdom, uh, and creativity is God's care. The psalm doesn't only teach that God has a hands-on role in creating each part of his creation, though that's true. It also teaches his ongoing involvement, something that we have allowed to lapse because of the way that we do science. Okay? And the language is poetic, of course, because God's providential hand is usually invisible to us, and we have no idea how he interacts with the world from day to day. Nevertheless, when we pray the Lord's Prayer and say, give us this day our daily bread, it ought to remind us of the way that God provides for the animals, exactly the same way we are asking God somehow to make the food in his world get to our plate. And he does the same for us as he does for animals. It's an ongoing involvement, it's fantastic. Verses 3 to 4 describe him as controlling the weather and even poetically using it to travel. Yeah. The springs and the grass were not only created for the animals, it says, but he makes sure that the supply is adequately maintained. He's got the kind of supply chain so sorted out as well. Do you often think about God doing that? We've already seen how the psalm shows God actually finding food for the lions. It's a wonderful picture, that, isn't it? Uh, but it also describes the arid mountains as being made for the sake of the wild goats and the cliffs for the conies. Uh, if you ever go to the Holy Land and you go down to sort of Engedi, go to the King David National Park, because when you walk up the kind of the valley there from Engedi, you can see sometimes the wild goats on the mountains and thinking, oh yeah, Psalm 104. And you walk up the path a bit further and there are these sort of thickets and these little kind of coney things, these rock badgers, kind of come out and sort of, you know, presumably they take peanuts if you gave it to them. I don't know if that's a good idea. But everywhere is God's creating environments for these animals to live in. And it even describes that great sea monster Leviathan, whatever that actually means as being created in effect to have fun in the sea and you do see animals sort of apparently enjoying the, the world don't you you know playing the the ravens in the winter kind of circling around there's a purpose of what they do but they do seem to be enjoying it 
But the core passage about his care is perhaps in verse 27 to 30, and I'll read it. These all look to you to give them their food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they're satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send your spirit, they're created and you renew the face of the earth. If we have ears to hear, there's a wonderful mixture of care for individual animals and for the world as a whole. It's not in the least sentimental, is it? Um, this is not fluffy bunny stuff, this is, this is real natural history. Within the household management of God in his world, he takes away the life of individual, anim individual animals and it even records that they're troubled when he does so. And yet that's all within his wise provision for the earth is renewed. Our physical world is designed to run on a constant cycle of death and rebirth. And that makes sense. You wouldn't really want your insect with sort of 20,000 offspring <laughs> to have each 20,000 producing 20,000 the next week and so on. Everything is done in wisdom. And of course, spring is a very good time to see how good a plan that is. So on the way home, still a few daffodils left, primroses are coming out, violets, all sorts of stuff. Now there is a big danger, I think, for Christians of saying, oh, I'll to this on a Sunday and kind of casting it aside on Monday when we fall into the modern myth of nature as being something, almost perhaps a personal being operating beyond God's control, the wisdom of nature. Not a biblical idea at all. Behind much of our modern science, sadly, there's an unspoken assumption that what happens in the world either happens because of laws of nature which God can't or won't change, or because of chance which God can't predict or control anyway. So you've got these sort of two big things which God has to stand back and sort of say, well, I can't help that. Maybe we allow that the occasional miracle breaks the pattern, but that means he's interfering with nature, so we wouldn't want him to do that too often, would we? Okay. But I have to say that that view of the world and that view of science, actually, is deism. It's not Christianity. Because in Psalm 104, God is in intimate control of everything in nature, personally. How that works is a different matter but God is overseeing it all. And it's not poetic license, it's simply the usual way that God governs his world. Now what we call laws of nature are no more than God working regularly and faithfully. Every morning some of you take your dog by the same route. Uh, you know, watch the stars in the same way, whatever it might be. You do the same thing, you go to, those who go to work, go to work in the same way. There's no law that makes you do that. That's your choice because, you know, the dog requires being faithfully taken out and the employer requires that you turn up at the same time every, every day. When God works faithfully and regularly, that's what we call laws of nature. Or else maybe he gives his creatures natures that also show regularity and predictability because you know, you know that lions may eat you. You don't keep them in the home. It's, it's good that we know that, isn't it? Because if they usually didn't eat people, <laughs> and then suddenly, a bit like the rock violas that suddenly attack people, yeah. What we call chance is God working unpredictably through his special providence, which the psalm says extends to the whole of nature, not just to our answered prayers. We pray hoping that God maybe will, will change things for us. Yeah? Somebody's sick, we pray for healing. And that's God's providence. We pray for our daily bread. We're not praying for miracles, are we? Usually, unless we're kind of, you know, haven't got any money left in the world. But we're just praying that God, in his providential care, will make sure that these things work together for our good. And God is working in his world by providence. I say what they call special providence in theological terms. Um, and the psalm says that extends to the whole of nature. And even the 
agnostic um, cosmologist Fred Hoyle was forced to conclude when he was looking at some of the things in nature, he said, there are no blind forces worth talking about in nature. And I think we need to keep reminding ourselves when the TV science documentary is telling us differently that the world doesn't run on blind chance and necessity, but on God's choice and his faithfulness. Big difference. Same phenomena, it works exactly the same way, but you realize that your father is working in each thing in nature, close up. And that means that whilst we may not know why God acts or doesn't seem to act in any particular situation, we can expectantly pray about anything. You can pray about the weather, even though the weather forecaster says something different. <laughs> Maybe because the weather forecaster says something different. You can pray about the climate because he's in charge of that. You can pray for, about viruses at home and abroad. You can pray about whatever the next panic that we're asked to panic about is. And you can know that God is the Lord of nature and that we aren't. Remember the old song, he's got the whole world in his hands. What that implies is that we don't. Now, God created us to care for and to rule his creation, but it is Jesus who preserves and saves it, not us, for we are not its creator and sustainer. And that's a balance that is easily lost when we talk about saving the planet. And there's an old university, um, it wasn't a friend of mine, it was a friend of a friend. He said, Saving the planet? The planet was decisively saved 2,000 years ago. Remember that. In fact, mankind actually gets very little mention in this psalm, doesn't he? Um, it's looking at everything in the world, but not much at mankind. We appear briefly in verse 23, doing our work whilst the wild animals are asleep. Yeah, And in verses 33 to 34... There's an appropriate summary of human praise, which we might all echo as we look at God's world on the way home. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. May my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. A lot of our function as human beings in this world is to give glory to God in a conscious way for what he's made. The creation praises him just by being what it is. We praise him by knowing what it is. But the psalm actually ends with a fly in the ointment. An unexpected sting in the tail. <clears throat> now it's a bit like the surprise ending of Psalm 139, which is the one that Mike first suggested I do today, but I changed my mind. Um, you will remember that's the psalm about how fearfully and wonderfully we're made. Another wonderful psalm. And how the Lord knows all about us and even knows our thoughts before they're on our lips. This wonderful picture of God as the person who's so intimately connected to human life. But then at the end of the psalm, it suddenly changes key to, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. And it goes on in that vein for about four verses. Well, this psalm is somewhat similar if a little bit more restrained you only get half a verse on it because after this hymn to creation this wonderful picture that transforms our view of what the world is about and the last verse suddenly says let sinners be consumed from the earth and let the wicked be no more so why does it do that why does it sort of spoil the show by reminding us of human sin well, I, be I believe it speaks to a feeling that many natures have, not least, of course, Chris Packham's spring watch frame. And I think it corrects the way that some uh, people who love nature can react to it. Because there is an unhealthy hatred of humanity in some conservationism that actually sees mankind as a parasite on the face of the God nature. And you will come across that if you haven't already. The idea that, you know, if, if humans weren't around, the world would be a good place. You know, that we're constantly having to 
make amends for our, our terrible sins. That view, I think, is actually rather dangerous because many green policies actively seem, seem to seek to harm humanity to save the planet, that planet that Jesus has already saved, remember. But the psalmist, I think, has a different view. There is indeed something that denies the beauty and wisdom of nature, but it isn't humanity as such, for which God, God, for which, sorry, for which God, humanity, God created for his praise and his glory as part of his good creation. But the bad fly in the ointment does come from humanity and you'll not take much prompting to know that that is sin. It's called sin. Now sin does damage creation, it's true, just as the conservationists say. Spilling oils across the ocean is not a good thing. Doing gain-of-function research on viruses and then losing control of them is actually rather worse. As for nuclear bombs, I have never met one I liked. But the real harm of sin is actually worse than that. Alone in God's good creation, the creation we've been learning about in this psalm, sin denies the goodness of its maker. And it actually turns the benefits of creation against him. I often find myself nowadays looking out at nature. Thank goodness I've got a window that shows it. You know? I'm heartily glad not to be living in Vauxhall anymore. But I brood on the news and I think oh, our bit of the world is in a sorry mess. Thank God that his bit is as wonderful as ever. And I think that actually is an appropriate response uh, when things are getting us down to be able to actually say, oh, yeah, Humanity is, is messing things up, but look at that. Um, you can look out of it, pretty well any window in the world and see part of God's beauty and creation. So let's do it. Our hearts should go on from that feeling to say, like the psalmist, let sinners be consumed from the earth and let sinners, sorry, let sinners be consumed from the earth and let sinners be no more. It's a prayer that is already answered in the work of Jesus who has defeated sin and death and a promise that will soon be fulfilled in his return. And that, I think, is the end point of the psalm, because the time when sinners will be abolished from the earth, and the world will be as it was created to be, and even better than it was first created to be, will be the time when Jesus returns. And that could be any day. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.